So a lot of people have asked me to comment on Volume 5 of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's five-volume report on the Trump-Russia investigation. There's been a lot of interest uh, about this Volume 5 report, which contains the uh, SSCI's uh, counterintelligence findings for a number of months now, ever since on May 15th of this year, the uh, committee announced that it was sending its report, that it had completed it, and that it was almost a thousand pages long, and that it was sending it to the uh, U.S. intelligence community. Specifically, it appears, uh, to the FBI, and presumably for review by the CIA as well, um, and possibly other intelligence agencies to determine what should be redacted from the report. So ever since that happened in May, there's of course been great anticipation about whether this incredibly long, presumably incredibly detailed, uh, report full of a type of finding we haven't really read yet about the Trump-Russia investigation, that would be counterintelligence findings rather than criminal findings, is going to be released prior to the election. And of course, uh, just recently, we got some indication that that redaction process, that classification process, which is fundamentally a negotiation between branches of government, the Congress being the legislative branch and the intelligence community being entirely part of the executive branch, um, is, is coming to a close. And, uh, you know, that's actually a little bit surprising in terms of how quickly it has moved. The idea that uh, it would, quote unquote, only take from mid-May to um, late July, so a matter of just two and a half months for that uh, negotiation between branches of government to unfold is is interesting, particularly when what it means, and this is why there's so much excitement about this volume five of the five volume SSCI report, um, when it means that that report could be released prior to the election. Um, one of the things that I started talking about uh, a very long time ago, um, I, I guess it would have been right when the Mueller report was released over a year ago, was the fact that on page 10 of volume one of the Mueller report, which I tended to focus most of my Twitter attention on in uh, my writings about the Mueller report, in my interviews about the Mueller report, and then frankly later on in, in my book Proof of Conspiracy, um, which came out in 2019, I focused a lot of my attention on volume one, and I focused quite specifically a lot of attention in proof of conspiracy, in my writings, in my interviews, in my media appearances, in my threads, in my discussions with people online and off on that page 10 of volume one. Because in it we learned that Robert Mueller had sent along to the FBI counterintelligence division, um, that would be FBI CD, not FBI CID, um, CID is the criminal division, but he had sent along some unspecified stock of evidence, um, presumably fairly large given how many people were working on the Mueller report, how many investigators he had, how long he was working on it, the type of information major media told us that he was accumulating. Um, presumably a very large stock of information was sent by Mueller to FBI CD and was not included in any way as part of the Mueller report. The Mueller report had a very narrow focus, as we now know. Robert Mueller decided to investigate exclusively the question of whether there was a conspiracy, a criminal conspiracy, between the 2016 Trump campaign and the Kremlin uh, to hack into um, the electoral infrastructure of the United States and various political entities like the DNC, or whether there was a before-the-fact conspiracy, again, a criminal conspiracy, between the Trump campaign or elements of the Trump campaign and the Kremlin to run a uh, cyber war of propaganda against the United States prior to the 2016 election. Now, as I've said many, many times, 
uh, in my books and on my feed and everywhere else um, in discussions with media and so on. The allegation that was investigated by Mueller um, in Volume 1 was not an allegation that had been made by Trump's critics. There was no allegation of a hacking conspiracy. There was no allegation of a before-the-fact propaganda conspiracy. Um, Trump's critics had said that, in fact, the Trump-Russia case was a matter of bribery. Um, Vladimir Putin offering future business opportunities to Donald Trump and the Trump Organization in exchange for pro-Russia foreign policy, which was frankly what was laid out in the Steele dossier and was later confirmed by Michael Cohen and what we learned about Donald Trump negotiating for a Trump Tower Moscow with Kremlin agents um, and allies of President Putin in 2015 and 2016. But the allegation investigated by Mueller was, was much narrower and, again, hadn't really been brought up by any of Trump's critics. And so, not surprisingly, Mueller found that he couldn't establish that beyond reasonable doubt. Not that there was um, no evidence of collusion, but that there was um, no evidence necessarily or limited evidence of a criminal conspiracy to hack uh, or, before the fact, to spread propaganda, which is a very different proposition than collusion, which is, of course, a much broader term, uh, and which is detailed, frankly, throughout Volume 1 of the Mueller report, specifically with respect to Paul Manafort. So that was the first half of what Mueller looked at. And of course, the second half was the question of whether there was obstruction of justice. Um, pretty clearly, Volume 2 of the Mueller report establishes that in Mueller's view and the view of his investigators and his attorneys, there were at least 10 incidents of obstruction of justice. They merely sent that issue along to Congress to, for Congress to make a determination about what to do about it. And we know what happened there. Bill Barr interceded and so on. But my focus for the moment here is on, on volume one, which is the fact that Robert Mueller did not look at the bribery question, did not look substantially at the aiding and abetting of computer crimes after the fact, did not look substantially at the solicitation of illegal election uh, assistance from foreign nationals in the fall of 2016, because those items he passed on for other federal investigations, other federal criminal investigations, some of which we now know have been shut down or impeded in various ways by Bill Barr. But on the question of counterintelligence, which is an entire um, sphere of evidence, an entire sphere, frankly, of uh, law enforcement that, of course, is the national security end of law enforcement that has uh, different evidentiary standards, different methods of data collection, but also deals with different topics. Um, specifically, counterintelligence in the Trump-Russia case would deal with the matter of whether Donald Trump had been compromised by a foreign power. Now, when we use that term compromised, it sounds incredibly uh, cinematic and wild and, and crazy, and people get all sorts of ideas in their heads uh, about what we mean when we say compromised. Um, to be compromised simply means that someone has either some sort of leverage over you, or that you have been put in a position or put yourself in a position where you can no longer act uh, in an unvarnished, clear, and unadulterated way in the interests of the United States and consistent with your oath of office. So while there was so much conversation because of the Steele dossier about the idea that if such leverage existed, and to be clear, um, those who were atop the CIA and the FBI in 2015 and 2016 absolutely believed and have said in many interviews and documents that they do believe there is some leverage uh, between Donald Trump and certain other foreign uh, autocrats, including Vladimir Putin. But to be very clear, um, while the Steele dossier focused on the possibility of some sort of a, a tape of a sexual nature, and of course the CIA did tell the BBC that multiple such tapes existed, and I've talked about that reporting extensively, and so a lot of attention because the Steele dossier and the BBC report had to do with a tape, something very salacious. Uh, in fact, the, the allegation primarily made against Donald Trump is that any leverage held over him by Russia or any other nation has to do with his business interests, has to do with finances, uh, either deals he's made, allegations of money laundering, or, and I find this much more likely, the other type of leverage, which is that he's simply been compromised by promises of future deals that he has committed himself to. 
through letters of intent and through other actions and just through statement of interest in setting up these future deals for the Trump Organization, not just in Russia, but in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates, in Egypt, in Israel. I mean, these are things that I've laid out in my books in great detail with documentation and reference to major media sources. That's what, what counterintelligence would consider. So if Robert Mueller in investigating um, the Trump campaign's connections to Russia came across information suggesting that Donald Trump's ability to carry out his duties as president could have been in some way compromised by either leverage or by his own business interests and various conflicts of interest. And I'll just mention as a side note that Donald Trump has confessed publicly to conflicts of interest in, at a minimum, the nation of Turkey that relate to his business interests. And John Bolton has since said that Trump's foreign policy as to Turkey, in fact, is compromised. All of those items, whether they have to do with uh, Turkey or Russia or Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Egypt or Israel or Azerbaijan or anywhere else um, that Donald Trump has business interests, that would all be contained in the documents that were sent by Mueller to the FBI Counterintelligence Division and, of course, contained in any files that the FBI Counterintelligence Division had developed itself with respect to its own ongoing counterintelligence investigation of Donald Trump because many people forget that the intelligence community was running for years and as far as we know might even still be running a counterintelligence investigation on whether Donald Trump or anyone associated with his campaign or associated with his businesses has been compromised by a foreign power and therefore is affecting the national security of the United States by putting Donald Trump in a position where either he can't or won't or has chosen not to um, wittingly or unwittingly um, execute his duties as president and adhere to his oath of office. So we presume that there is a massive stock of information developed by FBI CD and developed by Robert Mueller and then sent to FBI CD that has to do with this other type of evidence. Um, not a hacking conspiracy, not a propaganda conspiracy, but Interestingly, quite close to the allegations of bribery, which can, of course, lead to uh, compromise, can, of course, lead to national security being implicated, that Trump's critics, like myself and like many, many others, have been talking about and writing about for years. So to the extent the Trump-Russia case was always and will always be a bribery case, an aiding and abetting of computer crimes after the fact case, uh, a solicitation of a legal foreign aid case, it has criminal dimensions that Robert Mueller clearly didn't look at. Uh, if he passed them on to other federal jurisdictions, as he may have done, particularly with respect to the Trump inauguration, we don't know the status of those investigations, but we know that um, William Barr's edict against any investigations of candidates or anyone associated with a campaign would make those investigations virtually impossible to uh, undertake and continue with during the 2020 election cycle. We're left with a situation where all of that evidence is in the hands of the FBI Counterintelligence Division. Now, for many, many months, um, now going back to the release of the Mueller report, I hammered home this idea that we needed to see the FBI Counterintelligence Division's report um, on these matters, on this evidence sent to it by Mueller and that it had developed itself. Now, I didn't know in demanding that report whether, in fact, such a report yet existed. The point was to say either there isn't a report and there needs to be and it needs to be released, or there is a report and it needs to be released, or if there's never going to be a report, we certainly need some kind of summary or overview or insight into the evidence that the FBI Counterintelligence Division has, simply because if their investigation has come to a conclusion that Donald Trump may have been compromised by a foreign power, again, that doesn't mean he's some secret agent for another country. And in fact, that's not an allegation that's been part of the criticism of Donald Trump from anyone but those on the very, very fringe, that Donald Trump is a witting, W-I-T-T-I-N-G, Kremlin agent who is acting knowingly 
on behalf of the Kremlin rather than the United States. That's not a credible allegation. It hasn't made up the part, um, either the better part or really any part of serious criticism of Donald Trump. But this idea that he may have been compromised unwittingly or through choices he made in his business dealings, we need to have that information prior to the 2020 election because, number one, if he has been compromised, it's immediate grounds for impeachment on what you would call national security grounds, a preponderance of the evidence showing that Donald Trump cannot be trusted by the American people or known by Congress to be executing his duties consistent with U.S. national interests as opposed to the interests of another country or his business interests. Um, And barring a second impeachment, we still need to know because it would be important information to Americans have when they go to vote. And let's be clear in saying that you don't have to prove that a president is compromised beyond reasonable doubt for it to be information that could lead to impeachment and, frankly, that every voter should have before going in the voting booth or sending in a mail-in ballot. If you even were to show that it was more likely than not 50.1% true, or 50.1% likely, that a president um, were compromised, it's hard to imagine Uh, that president remaining in power, not being impeached. It's hard to imagine any American who loves America voting for that president. So no one really knows why we haven't heard from the USIC, from the U.S. intelligence community, any of its components, the CIA, the FBI, NSA, uh, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, or anyone else. We we don't know why we haven't heard anything, um, particularly surprising given how many former officials in those agencies are routinely talking about the fact that they do think Donald Trump has been compromised and is a national security threat right now. Um, but one possible reason that we haven't heard anything is that the executive branch is run by Donald Trump, that all of these agencies are technically under Donald Trump's purview. And as his firings of inspector generals have shown to us, uh, inspector generals excuse me, inspectors general uh, at various um, intelligence agencies as well as other government agencies within his cabinet, as that has shown to us, Um, and as his installation of political appointees who are the most radical, um, frankly, in the government, and, and him putting them in positions of power and authority and specifically power over not just administration and intelligence activities, but classification and so on. Um, You know, most recently, former Representative Ratcliffe, who has been associated with uh, QAnon conspiracy theories, you know, those sorts of actions by President Trump have shown us that he is attempting to not just politicize intelligence, but really put his cronies in charge of U.S. intelligence so that all intelligence decisions that could be harmful to his presidency, could be harmful more immediately now to his presidential candidacy, will be made in a way that redounds to his benefit rather than his detriment. So certainly issuing any counterintelligence report about the Trump-Russia fact pattern seems not just a distant possibility, but really an impossibility under the current um, ODNI. Um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the current Director of National Intelligence, who's occupying the head of that office. It seems just um, not beyond implausible. It seems impossible. That's also the reason why I say it was a little bit surprising that the negotiation regarding redactions between the Senate um, and the intelligence community was handled so quickly so expeditiously in a way that would allow that thousand page volume five of the SSCI investigation, which has been going on for years, to potentially come out before the election. Now, I think a lot of people would presume that the fact that that um, process of negotiation, that process of discussion between the branches of government, one being Congress, one being the branch of government run by the president, would tend to suggest that that Volume 5, as long as it is and as detailed as it is, um, isn't that harmful to the president. Now, I'm not saying that that's a fact. I'm saying some might surmise that from the fact that the executive branch that Donald Trump runs has made it possible for this report to come out before the election. Um, You would think that if this 1,000-page report were enormously damaging to the president, Um, that somehow the president would have found a way, as he has in every other instance, 
to you know put his hands on the levers of, of power and authority and classification and negotiation in the intelligence committee either directly or through his cronies to ensure that this report doesn't see the light of day prior to the election when in fact the news is telling us that we may well see this report so that's one thing that would make us believe this report is not going to be um, as jaw-dropping as we might expect a second thing a little bit simpler is just the fact that um, the work of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence has been largely bipartisan. The Democrats and the Republicans have worked fairly well together, and you would think we would start to hear a lot of squealing from the Republican side of the aisle if they believed that what was happening right now was that a report was being prepared and redactions being negotiated um, between the Senate and the U.S. Intelligence Committee in such a way that that report was going to come out and deep six Donald Trump's chances of election in 2020. We would hear something out of the Republican camp on that committee if they thought that that's what was going to happen. So that's a second reason to think that this volume five might not be uh, a barn burner. A third reason is that we've already had four volumes from the Senate that have been released. Um, and while there's been some occasionally interesting insights in those reports, generally speaking, the character of those reports has been, quote unquote, bipartisan, meaning that they don't tend to be damaging to either side of the political aisle. They tend to focus on threats to the United States from foreign entities, but not how there might be any connections between those entities and uh, any political organizations or political entities or candidates with the United States. Now, one reason for that, of course, is that those four, four other reports were mostly focused on foreign activities. They weren't focused on counterintelligence in quite the same way, meaning having to do with connections between U.S. nationals and foreign nationals. And therefore, we might presume that they wouldn't have been um, quite as, as controversial. But still, um, there's a history of the work of this particular committee that makes you think that this would be less likely um, to be, to be a barn burner. The fourth reason that we might surmise that this won't be as big of a deal as many people are making it out to be online is just the simple fact that if you look at the, um, the pattern up to this point with the release of these reports, you come to the following conclusion. As we have moved further and further away from the issuance of the Mueller report in the late spring of 2019. There has been less and less of an appetite from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, specifically those in Congress, to continue to pursue the general thrust of the Mueller investigation because of the fact that Mueller himself, in volume two on the obstruction issue, essentially just passed off any determination to Congress, thereby making the matter of impeachment um, or the matter of obstruction, I should say, wholly political and no longer a legal determination at all. Um, and we saw what happened with that, with the impeachment. And as to volume one, it was made so clear by Robert Mueller that his scope was going to be so narrow and so outside what Trump's critics were actually clamoring about Trump having done that it was evident that the intention of Robert Mueller was to send any further investigation on the more pertinent, relevant, and widely discussed elements of Trump-Russia collusion to various federal jurisdictions. Um, in, indeed, when the Mueller report was issued, there were 20 ongoing investigations uh, in the United States, both in Congress and in federal uh, DOJ offices around the country in various jurisdictions that were carrying on the work of Robert Mueller. Now, as I indicated previously, many of those investigations that were under the authority, ultimately, of William Barr appear to have been slowed or shut down or simply shuttered in the sense that we have no insight into them. There are no more leaks or conversations with media about the status of those investigations, um, in including ongoing investigations into Rudy Giuliani, Lev Parnas, Igor Fruman, Elliot Broidy, and so on and so forth. Um but if you take all of that together, there is this, you know, enervation, a sort of declining energy of doing anything significant with the 
what was believed to be the initial trajectory of their Mueller report, trying to uncover ties between the Trump campaign or its associates and foreign nationals. So it would be very surprising if despite a year of sort of decreasing energy surrounding um, the Mueller report and the thrust of that investigation resulting in anything politically significant for the Senate, um, the, the more deliberative of the two bodies of Congress, to suddenly leap out from behind a, a, a pillar in the you know Eisenhower Executive Office building and announce actually it turns out that there was a spectacular amount of conspiracy and we're going to be the ones to tell you about it and Donald Trump is a threat to national security and isn't it amazing how we kept from you for a year any sense that this sort of energy persisted in Congress around this issue. So those are five separate reasons to doubt that as exciting as Volume 5 seems like it should be, um, and as much as I would want it to be exciting, because I think the counterintelligence that I have gathered and discussed in Proof of Conspiracy, and now my book coming out in September, Proof of Corruption, is, is so astounding that it needs to be compiled not just in the books that I'm writing and in the interviews and words of former intelligence officials, but it also needs to come out in some sort of government document. So yes, it would be incredibly exciting. I would be frankly, the, the country's strongest advocate for Volume 5 to be the full expose of the counterintelligence dimensions of the Trump-Russia case that really was never touched upon beyond one sentence on page 10 of Volume 1 in the Mueller report. But that said, uh, I don't think it's likely for that to be the case. Now, me saying that, um, it's something I've said previously on Twitter, um, is not just that that, that Volume 5 should be exciting, it should be important, it should be what we're all waiting for, but that I fear that it won't be, even as much as I want it to be. Even just me saying that um, has been a matter of some controversy online among certain fringe elements in the uh, the, the sphere of people who write online uh, long exposés of Donald Trump and have been critics of his for as long as I've been. One reason it's been controversial is this. Um, I am adamant in saying simply the following, and this is something I, I, I haven't addressed here yet, and that is I do not believe that Volume 5 of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence five-volume report on the Trump-Russia matter is the same thing as any report that may exist within the FBI Counterintelligence Division, either a formal report or simply a very large file of connected documents that are being archived in a very particular way over at the FBI or the CIA. There are those who claim that Volume 5 of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report is one and the same with this mystical report from the FBI or CIA or just the U.S. intelligence community broadly writ that all of us have been waiting for. There are those who say that um, all along, unbeknownst to us, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence was not doing what the legislative branch is charged with doing, which is oversight over the executive branch, but in fact was working in cahoots secretly with the executive branch, the FBI, the CIA, to produce a unified cross-branch report that would conjoin Trump's executive branch, the executive branch that he runs, with the legislative branch that is run by the Republicans in the Senate and, of course, by the Democrats in the House. Now, that would really be extraordinary if there was cross-branch, not just negotiation over redactions, but if, in fact, this report had been created and written through a cross-branch partnership where one of the two partners is Donald Trump's own executive branch, working with Congress, and mind you, working with Democrats in Congress, to bring down the Trump presidency through a volume 5,000-page counterintelligence report that reveals that the president is compromised. If that sounds to you far-fetched, um, that's because it should. That sort of cross-branch, secret partnership largely um, led by 
Trump appointees and people who work for Trump's executive branch is not something that could happen under this administration. It's not something that would happen. It wouldn't happen under the leadership that Trump has put in charge of um, the national intelligence apparatus and infrastructure through his appointment to be the director of national intelligence. So I don't believe that there is any chance that those two reports are one and the same because it would suggest that there was that secret partnership. Moreover, there would be no need for a negotiation process over redaction between the Senate and the U.S. intelligence community if, in fact, they had created that report together. It wouldn't be a negotiation because they would have produced, at the time they produced the report secretly and in conjunction with one another, both a redacted version of the report and an unredacted version. There wouldn't be this reconciliation process that we've seen that, granted, moved quickly, but still took um, two and a half to three months. Um, and again, you know, the real argument for why it would, quote unquote, only take two and a half to three months would be all the evidence that I just laid out that this report is probably not the sort of smoking gun that some people would like it to be. Now, I said that my claim, my assertion based on the evidence that volume five of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's five volume counterintelligence report is not the same thing as the U.S. intelligence community's unpublished, possibly not even yet extant report on the counterintelligence findings it has made in the Trump-Russia investigation. I said that that was controversial, and it's controversial to the point that there is uh, a, a fringe but oddly popular Twitter account that has said that my statement that those two reports are not one and the same is by itself proof that I am a Kremlin agent and that I am going to be arrested um, as a disinformation agent who was actively working to assist Donald Trump in compromising U.S. national security. Now, obviously, um, that's, that's crazy. Any person who continues to follow that sort of Twitter account that would make that claim uh, baldly, and of course, needless to say, without even a scintilla of evidence, um, needs to really rethink their social media consumption strategy. But as I've laid out here, it's also just a wildly irresponsible and insane, reckless, um, baseless conspiracy theory to believe that there has been a massive cross-branch, government-wide, um, anti-Trump conspiracy to, right before the election, drop a thousand-page damning report about Trump's uh, interactions with, and to be clear, not just Russia, but a counterintelligence report would deal with his connections with all of these other countries that I've written about at great length in my books, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Israel, uh, Turkey, China, uh, and so on. So it would be the most astounding anti-Trump conspiracy right under Trump's nose within the executive branch for this volume five to be that sort of document. Um, having said that, it certainly is unlikely that in a thousand pages of counterintelligence findings, there won't be anything damaging about Donald Trump. I suspect there would be quite a lot that is damaging about Donald Trump. All I would suggest is that it might not be anything that is more damaging than the, the level of damage that was already waged against this administration in the Mueller report and in years of findings by investigative reporters working for major media. And to be very clear, the Mueller report was wildly damaging to the president. Major media reporting on Donald Trump's connections with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Israel, Russia, Turkey, and China, all of which I have written about across 2,500 pages and 12,000 major media citations in the trilogy of books known as the Proof Series, Proof of Collusion from 2018, Proof of Conspiracy from 2019, and coming out on September 8th, Proof of Corruption. That is a compilation, what I put together, 
of major media investigative reporting that is incredibly damning, um, both as to criminal matters and counterintelligence matters. So when I say this report would be unlikely to be any more damaging than the Mueller report was, than my books were, than major media investigative reporting has been, that's not to say that it wouldn't be damaging. But the the level of damage that we would expect to see from a basically unredacted U.S. intelligence community counterintelligence report on Donald Trump, which is what I've been calling for now for well over a year, that level of damage is, uh, you know, not to, to put it too lightly, is next level. It's a next level of damage because it has access to sources and methods and evidence uh, beyond that which any major media investigative reporter could have access to. Therefore, beyond anything um, that I as an author or a researcher or a scholar or a Trump biographer could have access to. Um, and that may be one of the reasons why we'll never see any such report. It may be, in fact, now that Trump has politically taken control of the U.S. intelligence community, it may be why there isn't even any such report extant. Because if the U.S. intelligence community were to put together everything it has on Trump's dealings with all of these different countries, it would suggest, su suggest such a level of compromise, um, indeed the level of compromise that is, is hinted at in John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened, is hinted at by major media reporting like the New York Times report about a Trump Tower meeting in August of 2016 in which representatives of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE offered a legal election assistance to the Trump family in the person of Donald Trump Jr. And Donald Trump Jr. said yes, as I detail in my book, Proof of Conspiracy. I mean, that is uh, a, a level of damage that maybe hints at what could be revealed in a full USIC file on all of Donald Trump's relationships abroad. But the notion that after the war Donald Trump has waged against the FBI, criminal division, and has waged against the counterintelligence community since 2016, after years of that warfare that has caused such damage to the CIA and the FBI and caused such fear and loss of morale within those entities and those agencies, that after years of that, the plan of the U.S. intelligence community would be to foist upon the American voter weeks before a presidential election the most damning, complete, and unredacted intelligence document ever published about Donald Trump is just, it's frankly, lunacy. Um, and it's what we refer to as hope porn. And there are people, unfortunately, out there I mean, I, I tend to find, and I think others find, my feed as a very, my Twitter feed, to be a very downbeat feed. Um, for all the times I've been accused of providing false hope, those who actually read my feed on a daily basis call it one of mo the most depressing things that they've ever encountered online. And that's because I'm a realist, and what I'm providing is based in evidence. Anyone who is creating a feed uh, about Donald Trump, and there are unfortunately some people doing this right now, that is sort of relentlessly promising you that right around the corner, everything's going to be okay. Before the election, um, we're going to determine that uh, up and down the line of U.S. government, everyone was actually secretly a hero, and America's going to have very ready and easy access to the truth about Donald Trump. Um, that is hope porn. Uh, I spent years writing three books on Donald Trump, just trying to curate as best I could from thousands of sources, going back decades from around the world, to just try and give some indication of what the truth was. Um, that was a, an arduous amount of work just to give us some sense of the truth. The idea that we would easily, and just you know, sitting in our lazy boys, have handed to us right before the election the full story and that there'd be a massive anti-Trump conspiracy that would make this happen. Um, you know, if you believe that, then you probably believe the person who wrote uh, the book A Warning. Remember, there was a book called A Warning that was written by Anonymous, who assured us that there was a very active resistance within the Trump administration. We find virtually no evidence of that. So it's one thing to have had confidence, as I did, in Robert Mueller, 
that Robert Mueller would investigate the full scope of potential criminal offenses committed by Donald Trump and his aides, allies, agents, associates, and advisors. Um, I thought he would do that because that's frankly what any prosecutor would have done, particularly a man of integrity like Robert Mueller, and frankly because major media was telling us every few days, here's what Robert Mueller is working on. And the scope of what he was working on was exactly the responsible, broad, fully sourced scope that you would expect a talented, experienced, accomplished federal prosecutor to pursue. Yes, I and many, many others had confidence that Mueller would do his job. Um, when he issued his report, we found that he did his job very well on obstruction. He just passed it on to Congress and thereby made those 10 acts of obstruction of justice that he'd proven beyond a reasonable doubt a political question that really couldn't be resolved with the current partisan divide. And we found that on volume one, he had sent most of the good stuff, the counterintelligence evidence, to the FBI counterintelligence division, and he'd referred anything but the very narrow criminal incident that he wanted to look at, or alleged criminal incident, I shouldn't even say alleged because no one had alleged it, but this idea of a hacking conspiracy, anything that wasn't that, he sent it on to these 20 other investigations. Um, that was deeply disappointing for those of us who thought he would take up all of those mantles himself. Um, but I'm certainly not going to translate that disappointment into a false claim that the other two pieces that we didn't get from Mueller, that being the ongoing federal criminal investigations into bribery and money laundering, and then secondarily, the counterintelligence investigation, are suddenly going to fall into our lap before the election. In fact, I would very clearly say that William Barr will make sure that we don't hear a peep about those federal criminal investigations prior to the election. He already did that through his edict, as well as his actions, um, forbidding that sort of quote-unquote election interference prior to the election through federal investigations becoming public, unless, important caveat from Barr, it's the Durham report, which is a federal investigative report about the campaign that benefits Donald Trump. Um, and then on the counterintelligence side, as I said, we've seen no evidence um, to even make us certain that such a report exists, let alone that one would come out. So all of this is to say that I'll be very interested to read Volume 5 of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's report when it comes out. I'm not expecting it to be a game-changer any more than the Horowitz report was a game-changer for Trump. I think there will be valuable information in it. I think that there will be things for us to talk about and for the media to cover. I think they will be damning to Trump at the same level as the Mueller report, at the same level as major media reporting for a very long time, and therefore, because they will be at the same level of damning that was already ignored by America, we can expect that this will also be ignored by America. It won't be a next level event. Um, and those who are saying otherwise, I, I urge people to really deal with such people with extreme caution. Um, they are acting in a dangerous fashion by giving people false hope. And of course, in a more personal way, I will say they are acting extremely dangerously by calling Kremlin agents and disinformation agents people who frankly have been pushing for that FBI counterintelligence report for far longer than they have and who have done more than they have and worked harder than they have and put themselves out there under their real names more than they have to be Trump critics. They are uh, attacking those people and calling those people in, into question in a way that I, I frankly would call obscene. Uh, and it's not just me. Um, the same sorts of completely false allegations have been leveled against Sarah Kenzior, uh, Malcolm Nance, other people who appear on MSNBC, other people who have written books about Donald Trump and who are the first to criticize Donald Trump when it's warranted, the first to provide uh, hope and optimism to Trump critics and Trump opponents when it's warranted, but who are also always trying to be realists about what we can expect and always trying to base their conclusions in the evidence that we have, in the facts of what we know about government and who controls the levers of power, and also just in history. Um, what we've seen in terms of cross-branch collaborations or the lack thereof over the last four years, what we've seen 
in terms of Trump's takeover of the national intelligence apparatus. Those of us who are Trump critics understand that we have a very um, serious role to play if, if people will allow us to play it, and that we abuse it when we offer false hope, we abuse it when we offer false cynicism, we abuse it when we don't stand by the evidence. So let's look forward to this Volume 5 from the Senate Select Committee uh, on Intelligence's five-volume intelligence report when it comes out, hopefully, in the next month or two. Um, let's certainly, as people who value the truth, amplify anything that's in that report that is novel and illuminating. And frankly, even things that merely report what, repeat what's in the Mueller report should be further investigated and discussed again, because they certainly weren't focused enough on uh, when the Mueller report was issued. Um, but let's also not let the U.S. intelligence community off the hook for a body of evidence that they are still holding on to and almost certainly are not going to give us any inkling of before the election. It's a failure of the intelligence community. It's a failure of integrity and transparency within the counterintelligence community to not have provided that information to us. And if we pretend that the Senate is going to give it to us, uh, we are essentially exculpating the intelligence community by proxy and saying that they've acted appropriately and been fully transparent. And I would argue that from the moment the FBI denied in October 2016 that Donald Trump had any questionable ties to Russia, even when it knew that that wasn't true, there has been reason to doubt the candor and transparency and willingness to engage uh, the American people in honest conversation about Donald Trump that I believe will continue through the 2020 election, and more is the pity for the American people. Thank you for listening, and I hope to talk to you again soon.